Can you hear me? Great. <laughs> Yeah, I'm Lily Puras from DZ Zeuthen, and I will talk about the prospect for cosmic ray me measurements with the Radio Neutrino Observatory in Greenland, ERNOG. And on top, you see already one of our stations. They're uh, buried in snow, so it's basically solar panels. Yeah. Uh, are we in the right window? I never said. Okay, all right, so um, Arno G is located on the top of the Greenlandic ice sheet on three and a half kilometer height. And you see here, this is uh, the array we have planned so far. It consists of 35 stations. And those seven one here are the ones we have already built. And each of these dots uh, stands for one of those. And so our station consists of three in ice strings, which are down to 100 meters, and nine surface antennas um, here at the top. Um, three of the surface antennas are facing upward to detect cosmic rays, and six are facing downward, which are also triggering neutrinos. And you see here that they're a little inclined, at least the neutrino ones. Um, this is how we imagine a neutrino event would look like. So we have here our detector, and the neutrino is coming in here, uh, showers, and the radio emission is the strongest on this red cone, which we uh, yeah, call yeah, maybe Cherenkov cone because it's a Cherenkov-like effect, which is at 56 degree in ice. And then our radio emission propagates to our detector. Um, this is our sensitivity prediction, and you see that we not quite get the extended ice cube flux, but we can cut into the area which is allowed from ultra high cosmic rays. This is for five years of RNOG. So now to the possible background events to neutrinos. Also, already talked yesterday about the neutrinos, and so I will talk more about the surface. Um, I made this little plot where we have here the air-ice interface, and of course we can, have, we can have cosmic rays and air shows, which then travel to our detector here and can be uh, measured by the surface antennas. What also can happen is that one of the muons out of a cosmic ray travels further into the ice and induces a particle cascade, which pretty much looks like a particle cascade induced by a neutrino. This can happen through catastrophic energy loss, so this is one background we might see. We can also have reflective layers due to difference in the ice densities. And another thing was Simon uh, de Cockeray investigated is that vertical cosmic rays have really dense energy cores, so in the center, which can also propagate into the ice and look like uh, uh, in ice induced uh, neutrino induced particle shower in ice. So I'll talk a bit more about the muon background. Um, as we've seen this morning, the muon flux is a tough thing, so I plotted it here for different hadronic interaction models, which is the line style, and for different cosmic ray compositions, so a really proton-rich one and proton-poor one. And you see that the, at the energies we are interested in, that's like around 10 to the 15 electron volt, um, this varies about like three orders of magnitude. If we fold that together with what Arno G might be able to trigger, then we see that um, we get maybe one muon in five years in the full array. This sounds pretty small, but the problem is that's the same order of magnitude we expect neutrinos to occur. And if we have a neutrino event, we really want to make sure it's not a muon. So these huge uncertainties, um, leads us to uh, a mitigation strategy. In this case, we have the advantage that, that muons stem from an air shower. So the idea is, if we measure the air shower, um, we can veto the in-ice trigger. So here's a plot showing the oh, numbers uh, of muons per year and the belonging cosmic ray energy. And you see that the most muons come actually from really high cosmic rays. And that's good because we're good in detecting high energy cosmic rays. Um, I tried to calculate that a little bit, how good a muon V2 would be. And you see that we are pretty good at the lower energies because there's a conventional flux, which also stem from high cosmic rays. And we are good at the high energies, but we like a bit of V2 efficiency uh, around 10 to the 15 muon shower energy 
energy, uh, yeah, muon shower energy in the ice. Of course, this V2 efficiency strongly depends on our ability to um, detect cosmic rays. Uh, so I will talk more about the trigger mechanism and the simulations for air showers. This is quite technical. So um, we have uh, our uh, incoming radio signal, which is here, like the simulated electric field. This goes through our antenna and the surface board, which is basically an amplifier. So here we add the uh, de de detector response and the amplifier. Um, together, it's built, it builds like this trace here in the time and the frequency domain. And you see it, there's a lot of group delay added because of all the hardware. On this trace, we apply a trigger and it consists of a filter, a diode and a coincidence check. Um, if you look here, it's a simple threshold trigger. We use a frequency band which is optimized for the signal so that we um, reduce noise and get to a lower threshold. And the coincidence uh, check also reduces the trigger rate. The problem is you see like this air shower signal, it's really like oscillating fast and that's not good for the FPGA who has to decide if it's triggered or not. So we need a mechanism to smoothen uh, the signal and this is done by a diode, in this case, a Schottky diode. The Schottky diodes are great because they're super cheap, they consume no power, and they're state or robust. But the problem is they're quite a finicky to uh, model. So um, because I tried to model it without the hardware, it was quite difficult. So I built a little hardware corner in our office um, with the, like, here we go. Um, yeah, with a frequency generator where I fed in like a cosmic ray signal. It went through the trigger board and then I measured it with the oscilloscope and this is how it looks like now. It's the smooth curve which the FPGA sees and where the threshold is applied on. The initial trigger design uh, has really limited sensitivity because we were short in time and hardware like most experiments are. <laughs> so. Here's a cosmic ray simulation. So uh, you probably all know this footprints. Uh, a very inclined shower, of course, are able to cover more, a bigger area of our detector, but also like with 50 degree, we might be lucky to get one. Here are the parameters I used for the trigger. And uh, I used 407 showers, simulated the effective area with two different uh, triggers, uh, diode response settings. So the um, <laughs> smoothing off the trace, basically. What we find out is that the effective area really depends on that trigger shape. So if we use that with the optimistic way, we have a huge or a bigger effective area. And if we use the pessimistic model of the diet, we use a lot of sensitivity below 10 to the 17 electron volt. If you fold that with the OJ flux, uh, which is, of course, a power law, you see that um, with the pessimistic um, scenario, you really miss out on all the cosmic rays below 10 to the 17, which makes the big difference between how many cosmic rays we expect per day. So if we get this low energy bin, if we are able to measure it, we get like around 80. If we're not measuring it, it's like eight. So um, that's quite sad, but it also gives us a reason to optimize our trigger. So let me summarize it for you. So RNOG is designed to detect EEV neutrinos, but also detects air shower. Um, the effective um, area really depends on the trigger characteristic, which are currently under study. Um, the background prediction have large uncertainties, but uh, the goal is that we can use all these backgrounds event as a calibration source and to verify that our detector works. The cosmic ray search is in progress, as well as the trigger optimization to increase the numbers of cosmic rays and also obtain a better calibration source. Thank you very much. Thank you.